Hi everyone, welcome to Dear Banff, the show for PR and marketing pros like you. Hosted by Beck Bamberger of BAM. BAM is a communications agency that believes stories move the world. We move stories forward for technology-driven brands that challenge, change, and create entire industries. Today, on the Dear BAM podcast, we're talking with Shimon, head of growth at OKCoin. Shimon is an experienced growth leader, skilled in digital strategy, search engine optimization, media buying, market research, and business development. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dear Banff, the podcast for marketing and PR pros like yourself. Thanks for joining us today. We are well into season two here, and we've just got such an all-star lineup here. Today, Shimon from OKCoin, you guys just heard all about his great experience now getting involved in crypto. Shimon, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. We're excited. And we got some juicy questions to go through. First thing, do you want to give us just a little soundbite on what OKCoin is up to, especially for those in the non-crypto spheres? Yeah, totally. So we're basically trying to be the most user-friendly crypto exchange out there. We started from being linked to OKEX, which is the largest exchange in the world based out of China. And then we started in 2014 operating out of San Francisco as an independent entity where you can do everything really, really easy. So you can connect your bank account, three clicks, and you can buy your first crypto. So we're trying to make Mm -hmm. onboarding really easy. I think a lot of people too, who are perhaps intimidated about that space are like, where do I even start? What do I even do? Is it fair to say it's a little bit of like the E-Trade or the Robin Hood for crypto? Yeah, we're basically between E-Trade and Robin Hood. I think we're much easier okay. than E-Trade. You can literally link your bank account through Plaid. You just give mm-hmm. your name and password and a couple of clicks for identity verification. And then you can just buy crypto or trade. Oh, that's great. I got to get on that diversify my portfolio this year. Okay. Excellent. What are you most proud about in terms of just accomplishing in this interesting last 12 months a year, let's say? Yeah, I'm just really proud of how this ecosystem is growing. So it's amazing to see a parallel financial system being built from scratch. We've Mm -hmm. never in anything like this, it reminds me a little bit of the internet, like in 94, 95, you know, when the browsers were really clunky and people didn't quite know what the internet is. So that's what crypto is. And recently, like over the last year, I think the regulatory field is changing really fast. So I wrote the marketing plan for a banking application that was the first banking application that got approved in Wyoming, a crypto company to actually be a licensed bank. So that was super exciting exciting. And I'm just like really impressed by how open regulators are to just integrating this field into the traditional financial system. Hmm. You feel that they're getting more open to it? Is that like, I know, for example, marijuana is widely more accepted now in the States, but that's been a long happening. So is the same happening, you would say, in parallel from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it's much more significant and bigger than other industries that get regulated because I think the U.S. is good at understanding innovation. And so the regulators here pretty much know that if they try to meddle too much, it will just stifle the whole industry. I had a really good story about like when the Internet was being built here in the 80s and 90s, it was all open source. And then Europe said, we need to build an internet too. And they had this government committee <laughs> trying to like design the protocol yeah. and everything. And they ended up with something that nobody used. So I think the US is good at understanding that like you start with something distributed, open source, look at where the usage is and then regulate as necessary, right? Yeah. So that's great. Oh, that's great. Oh, good to hear it on the crypto side. And then before we get into questions, just kind of one last thing, what's your favorite way to tell a story? especially now these days? So yeah, my favorite way to tell a story, I mean, being in marketing, we always kind of try to figure out how to yeah. meet business KPIs and how to you know grow the bottom line or top line or whatever the KPI is. But I actually learned when I was working at BCG at the Boston Consulting Group mm-hmm. in Chicago in my MBA internship, we did a lot of focus group work and we had like fantastic leaders of focus groups and they were really good into actually getting into the shoes of the consumer. 
So like really understanding what goes on in the mind of the consumer when they make the decision to engage with a product and like, what are their fears? What are their hesitations? What are their hopes, their dreams? And so when I come to tell a story, you know, to market a product, I always try to really, really think of like, okay, how does the consumer feel about this and dive a little bit deeper right into motivations. I know a lot of it is marketing 101, but many times people just don't go as deep as they could, right? When thinking mm-hmm. about So my favorite way is like when I tell a story, it's just like trying to see how will this story be perceived from the eyes of the consumer. Even if I'm presenting to like senior leadership of the company about business strategy or something, I always try to think, okay, are we doing the right thing as far as the consumers are? uh, I think that's the biggest challenge of any marketer as we think about it is what at the core is the fear, the need, the desire of that customer. And if you really can get to, it sounds so simple, but really it's not, especially in like this election cycle, like what's really at the bottom of people's thoughts, perspectives and so forth. So anyway, interesting to think about. Well, we have plenty of questions, Shimon, to get into. So I'm going to start off. Oh, we got a tough one to start off with too. So here we go. Okay. Dear Banff, I do not know how to navigate this tough one. In short, I told an old client of ours to refresh their messaging and that it was hurting our media efforts. Speaking of messages that resonate. They Mm. insisted nothing was needed, fired us, and then brought us back on. The kicker is that they internally just, quote, finish their messaging. And frankly, it is not in good shape, particularly as they are a multinational client dealing with the US, Asia, and a few other markets. I'm not in a place where I can fire them myself, say I told you so, and so on. But I'm stressed thinking about how to take this C minus messaging, especially as it might not land globally to each region and not find ourselves back at square one. What should I do? Yeah, this is a fantastic Mm -hmm. question because of two main things here that I'm happy to unpack. One is like the idea of global messaging, which is very different from region to region, right? So I remember I was, before business school, I was working for a global Forex broker and we literally had uh, tests where if you tell a German client you're going to make money, they think you're a scam. If you tell an Italian (laughs) customer, we are regulated, they think you're expensive and they won't engage with Mm. you. So literally you need to tweak the messaging based on the market. So Uh so I could totally understand if, you know, management wants to go with one messaging and go globally, it could underperform. And then the other thing is the subjectivity, right? Like they think it's good, but like actually C minus. So the way I would approach this is basically try to get as much quantitative insight into the conversation with the client. So to tell them, look, this is why we think it's C minus. And it's not just because it's our idea and our expertise. And we've been doing this for 20 years and that's why it's C minus, but like actually trying to show them why are they leaving money on the table, right? By using the messaging that they want to use. And then the other thing is to try to maybe say, look, okay, we can go with your messaging. But what if we just do a test with this other message just in one market or just in one product? Like basically try to show them and prove to them that something, you know, is better. And I know it's tough because like people get so attached to subjective perception of like, oh, this is what should work. So Mm -hmm. whenever I can bring data in. You took the words out of my mouth. You took the words out of my mouth. Keep going. No, that's pretty much it. So, I mean, I would just have a conversation on like, how can we validate their hypothesis? Basically, they think their hypothesis is right. I think it's wrong, but let's validate that. Let's mm-hmm. test it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. just come back and forth. And I've been there. I mean, it's, it's tough. And sometimes people get really attached. So again, I would just recommend a small test somewhere with a small portion of the budget just to gather data to prove hypothesis. Yeah, that's the big thing that stood out to me on this question too, because it sounds like finish their messaging, fired us, then brought it back on. They just finished it internally. Okay, other big clue, internally. Has this been checked anywhere? Has this been sussed out? That's back to the data, back to the testing. And always you test your messaging. Always you test. So perhaps the best partnership type of approach here can be, okay, great. Let's test that out with our various groups and ensure that we're super solid and we all know that this is going to resonate with all the various populations we have. 
Usually when you test it out, it doesn't. And you got to tweak things. So if you just propose the like, great, yep, let's take it. Let's put it out there. Let's test. Then you will see what the data provides. And now it's not a subjective approach from you, but it's the wisdom of the crowd of your users that you can point to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and also you can do a test that's either in one market and then the problem yep. is that you push back and say this one market is not representative of, you know, the global market. Or you can do it in like one touch point globally, for example, that's just true. like the ad layer of like online ads or something. And then you can see how the different markets react to it and just prove to them. So, yeah, it's a fun exactly. conversation to have. That's for sure. Exactly. I'm always a little hesitant. I've internally just finished. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Dear BAP, CMO or no? That's the question here. Short story. A very eager potential client wants to work with us pretty much yesterday. However, we learned on our last call that a new CMO is about to sign on with this client. I've recommended that we wait to connect with the CMO, bring them up to speed on what we've covered, and then have him or her be on our final pitch. The CEO wants to just sign us up right now. I'm concerned this will land badly with the newly hired CMO and start us off on a rocky foot because this person will have had no input on this decision. I should mention the CEO is totally technical and not someone who has worked with a number of agencies. What's your advice? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I First of all, if we could connect with the CMO kind of offline and maybe just like have coffee with them, that would be amazing. I know sometimes that's not an option. Yeah, sometimes it's probably not an option. But if that were an option, that solves it really easily. Like I have many times, you know, before joining a role, I've had people contact me and just you know, ask me different things or bring me up to speed. So that's one option. The other option is like, As long as we present this as being open to getting feedback from the CMO, I don't know necessarily that they would have a huge resistance. So, I mean, what's the worst case scenario? There's some direction and then the new CMO comes and wants to change the direction. As long as the methodology is right, that's like fine. I actually personally make a big deal about like when I do consulting and and also when I do full-time work is like talking about the process and the frameworks Mm -hmm. rather than the end result, right? So like Mm -hmm. many times you'll have some framework for doing something and the end result will change drastically based on different inputs. And those inputs are sometimes assumptions. Like sometimes we don't know things and we have to make assumptions. So in this case, even if the CMO disagrees, Maybe we can just say, look, let's use the same framework, change the assumptions and, yeah. and make, you know, make it palatable to the end result that the new CMO wants. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I can feel this question from being on the agency side of things. Okay. Best case scenario, the person goes, oh, totally love you guys. This is great. Here's my blessing. Great. Worst case scenario, though, is they come in guns blazing. No, 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 no. We're going to bring on this agency I know and trust and have worked with for years. And Mm -hmm. CEO, why in the hell did you bring me on with me now inheriting already this agency who I know from no one, you know? So perhaps the approach to the CEO, and now I'm assuming this person, this agency doesn't know who this CMO is because they haven't signed on the dotted line, Mm -hmm. is to appeal to the CEO and say, hey, best case scenario, worst case scenario. Don't you want to hedge against the worst case scenario? You don't want your newly implanted full-time employee to have agitation or concern about a decision you made with no background in it anyway. This is not your cup of tea. I just think from a, if you appeal to that more rational approach of, hey, CEO, don't you want your C-suite executive to be totally on board with your decision? What's it going to hurt if even on day one, you have them tee up and talk with this potential agency? It's not like you have to wait four and a half months or something. I think you could accelerate this just as easily. And it sounds like you're just dealing with a CEO who's chomping at the bit, wants to get going. I mean, this is nothing new here for any CEO seemingly. Like they're just, you know, they want to get going. But why position yourself? Why increase the chances of a worst case scenario? Yeah, that's a great point. You know? I mean, I assumed from the question that a lot of time is involved because otherwise, yeah, it should be a no brainer to wait. The question yeah, is, if the, CMO exactly. is like, if the CMO is supposed to join like three months from now and the yes, CEO wants to do some work during those three months, that's when it becomes good tricky. Point. 
But again, I mean, if we could either connect with them offline or just like get some work done and have a framework and then, yeah, you make a good point. If, if they don't know the agency, it could be tricky. Mm-hmm. Last question, Shimon. Here we go. Dear Banff, I have probably an age old question for the podcast. It is, I over delivered tremendously and killed myself doing so. And the client wants to see the exact same level of output next year. And oh, of course, for the same budget. What to do here? This is definitely a client I want to keep. Have you seen this, Shimo, where you're like, damn it, I'm a, <laughs> a burden of my own success now? Oh, yeah, totally. I've seen this many times. And like the easy answer to this question is basically just to set expectations, right? I realize that this may not be an option because, you know, the situation is that already, you know, the work has been delivered. And now they want more of the same. So first of all, next time, let's set expectations with the client of like, okay, maybe I'm doing this as a proof of concept, but then like long-term, the pricing will change. That being said, you know, now that this has already happened, I mean, I would just try to either, you know, pace myself a little bit slower and just like not kill myself. And then if the price is the same, maybe it will take a bit longer to deliver. But uh, yeah, I definitely think that burnout is a huge problem. So we shouldn't take on more and more and more work in, on terms that, you know, don't work for us. Because then eventually it hurts the client. Like eventually the work yeah, exactly. will get hurt, right? So I would just recommend, okay, it can be the same price, same output, but maybe like a little bit like slower or a little bit like more spread out or something. Mm-hmm. That's what I would recommend. Ugh, this happens. I've seen this many times. And in this case, one, I pray that this person has some data, back to data. Do you have the time tracking? Do you have that data to support? Now, if you do, then my next question is, well, why the heck did you not bring this up earlier? But but in all fairness, we don't know if this was like a project they did or was this a whole entire year? You know, for example, they said, kill myself doing so. Okay. Oh, well, you just refer to the next year. Okay. Hopefully you have some data to prove and say, hey, and you have the relationship to be able to say, hey, client, this account is so important for me. And because it is, myself, myself and the team went above and beyond to make sure that we did X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. That is not sustainable. Here is the data showing the hours we spent. Yeah. Unfortunately, which is totally on me, by the way. It's not their fault. It's not yeah. the client's fault. It's totally on you. So for us to proceed and have a good functioning relationship, we need to adjust to what reality is. So we need mm-hmm. to consider that, you know, we can only do 50% within this time frame. The other option is, well, if we want to keep that level, you pay to that level and we can keep going. But man, this is an age old situation, especially for on the agency side of things. And if you have not proven the ownership that you are in charge of managing the budget and you have not communicated what's going on with it, well, boo on you. So now this is your kind of mess to clean up, but give the client the option of like, well, to continue it's X and to adjust for what is reality in terms of what you are actually paying, we need to expect this output. And are you okay with that client? They might be pissed at that, but that's what happens in these situations. Yeah, that's what happens. And there's other ways, like maybe that person can bring someone to help them, you know, their less personal time is less stretched thin. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the client gets the same output, but it's just instead of one person doing everything, there's like two people involved. And then they have to take a hit on the profit margins. But I mean, if it's that or losing the client, maybe it's better to do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my. Well, Shimon, we have answered what we can today. All the crises, all the questions. There's always a bunch of them. We never escape. So thank you for helping with all the answers. And good luck in the crypto space. I got to get on there, get my account going. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think what's cool about marketing is that if people are excited about the product they market, it almost feels like doing something good. So all of these questions above, right? It Uh becomes much easier if you're working on a product that you think people actually benefit from. It makes the burnout, you know, less uh, stressful. It makes the conversations easier to do. So, so that's probably the best advice. Work on products that excite you. Yes. I love that. Let's end there. That's a positive high note. Work on stuff that excites you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for listening, everybody too. Thanks so much, Beck. It was great being here. 
Thanks for listening to Dear Banff, the advice podcast for PR and marketing pros like you. Our show was created by BAM, a PR and marketing agency headquartered in San Diego and New York City. The music you're enjoying today was composed by Tiffany Dizon, produced by Daniel Kessner, and played by San Diego Symphony's Art of Milan. If you have a tough PR and marketing question you'd like us to answer, write to us at bamtheagency.com forward slash Dear BAM. Don't forget the F. If you'd like to get notified of our latest episodes, subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.